Hi friends, welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about the other two plays that I read during week one of ShakeTube. I did a dedicated video on Twelfth Night that Jason hosted from Old Blues Chapter and Verse, um, but the other two plays that we read this week had some similar themes that I wanted to discuss together. So Coriolanus, that was hosted by Steve Donahue, and King John, which was hosted by Lukash over at Totally Pretentious, both focused on uh, the mother of a powerful man and how that mother's desire for the um, power of her son and his ultimate success ends up basically just ruining everything and taking place of the actual love for their sons. In King John, we have Eleanor, who is King John's mother, and Constance, who is the mother of Arthur, who is King John's nephew and the legitimate heir to the throne of England. However, King John is the one who gets the throne because his brother who has died and was the king has appointed him as the heir, even though that's questionable. The focus of the play is the legitimacy of King John or Arthur, and their mothers, Eleanor and Constance, are a driving force in the war that ensues between the two family members for that throne. Eleanor obviously wants her son John to keep the throne and fight for it however is necessary because she is basically the queen and she wants that power to continue. She, you know, obviously likes having that power. And Constance feels slighted for her son and believes that he is the legitimate heir and kind of forces Arthur to want the throne. One scene towards the beginning of the play, and actually one line by Arthur, really stuck out to me and proved that these mothers were really taking over and kind of forcing their sons to do what they otherwise wouldn't do. When Eleanor and Constance are arguing at one point over Arthur's legitimacy, Arthur stops his mother and says to her, I'm going to read it, Good my mother, peace. I would that I were low laid in my grave. I am not worth this coil that's made for me. This is an excellent example of what these mothers are doing to their son by, sons by their power hungry, uh, cloying and just mothering of these sons that they want to be so powerful. Arthur is obviously insecure, and, and he is actually quite young. I believe that he is a teenager at this time. He doesn't even want the throne, I feel, um, at least in the beginning. And Constance is just forcing this on her, on him, because she feels that she, I think she feels like she deserves it. And she doesn't want Eleanor to get the upper hand by having a king as a son. I believe that by uh, telling their sons what they want, they are actually trying to usurp the power from their own sons and so that they can get the upper hand against each other. Ultimately, Arthur is kidnapped and eventually killed and and John much the same and Arthur's mother I think realizes too late what her actions have done and has kind of a mental breakdown and in towards the end and talks about you know how her actions were justified but she has lost her son and she is she is allowed to weep and carry on because her son has been lost to her and she's right she does have that right she should be able to grieve for her son but what she didn't have the right to do I think is force her son 
into a war that ultimately caused his torture and his death. That was what was wrong. In much the same way, in Coriolanus, Volumina, I think is how you pronounce it, who is Coriolanus's mother, is overly proud of her son's battle wounds and like to a weird degree. Um, and, and again, there was a couple of scenes in the play that I want to highlight because they were, it was just kind of odd how proud she was of these wounds. In Act 1, Volumina is talking to Coriolanus's wife, Virgilia. Vir Virgilia is very against war and is afraid for her husband's death. And this is the response that she gets from her mother-in-law when she expresses concern that her husband is bleeding. She says, away you fool. It more becomes a man than guilt his trophy. The breast of Hecuba, when she did suckle Hector, looked not lovelier than Hector's forehead when it spit forth blood at Grecian sword contemning. contemning. I mean, that's some kind of mother right there. <laughs> I just, I don't know. <laughs> if I were a mom, I would probably try to convince my son not to go to war when I saw him coming back all bloody and just disfigured and anything else that has happened to him. I probably would not be real thrilled with him going to war, but not Volumina. She's like, get back out there and get some more wounds so that I can brag about you. So looking at this from a modern woman's standpoint, I see a vast amount of problems with the way these three women treat their sons. Number one, they're basically being uh, overbearing and your quintessential, uh, is it called helicopter mom? That they are just, they are lording over them and watching everything they do and trying to make them do what they want them to do at all times. It almost to me seems like these women are being even more manly than the men that they are trying to force into these actions. And I kind of wonder if that was what Shakespeare was going for during this time. Um, I feel like, you know, obviously women did not have power and their own agency back then. And I'm kind of wondering if Shakespeare was kind of giving a little commentary on what it would be like if women were given that that power over men or or even saying that women currently have enough power over men to make them go to war for for what they really don't want, and it's more about what the women want. Um, I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with that claim. I just, I just think that that might be what Shakespeare was going for in this, um, in these plays. The women are the ones who want to force their sons into action. They are the ones pleading for power, and then whenever their sons get the power sometimes in a couple of cases they plead for them to be more merciful and at that point i think they kind of feel like oh my gosh i went too far so they try to rein them back in and it doesn't really work out that way at that point and um and i wonder too is shakespeare kind of trying to prove the old adage behind every great man is an even greater woman <laughs> which again i'm not saying that i agree with that so don't come at me i'm just you know wondering that that is shakespeare saying that these men would never have done these great deeds or come to power if they didn't have a woman behind them prompting them to do these things i don't know so many questions but all I know is that these three women were some very powerful women, even though they did not come forward in their own pursuits of power. They wanted that power through their sons and they knew how to get it and they knew what buttons to push to make their sons do what they wanted them to do, proving that even when a woman doesn't have 
power. She still has power. <laughs> Whether it's for good or bad, I, in this case, I feel like it was bad. Um, and I don't think that Shakespeare always wrote his women characters that way. Definitely not. But uh, I definitely think in this case, these women maybe should have calmed down a little bit and maybe listened to their sons a little bit more than they did before just kind of going off the deep end and, you know, basically saying that their sons are not good enough if they are not king. Eh, you know, that, that's just me. I'm, I'm not really a fighter. <laughs> I wouldn't... I wouldn't try to get my husband or my son to go to war. It wouldn't be my thing. I'd probably try to be the opposite. I'd probably be like Coriolanus's wife that was very concerned when I saw my husband come home with a bleeding head. Wouldn't be all about that, really. So, <laughs> so yeah, these were two very interesting plays. I had never read these two before. I had read Twelfth Night. So that was a bit of a reread, and that's why that got its own separate video. But these were these were new to me, and I I'm not sure that they are going to be favorites. Um, yeah, I I'm not a big probably because I'm not really up on British history. Uh, I didn't really get a lot of um, King John's story. I didn't really understand where it was coming from so I think I would need a lot more background study before I read it again and um, Coriolanus was interesting I liked it but um, I definitely wouldn't watch a movie version of it it's very very bloody <laughs> but, uh, but yeah it was very interesting I and I definitely thought of these two plays the women were the most interesting part of the play. I just thought their behind the stage, power hungry nitpicking stuff was really cool. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, take that for what it's worth. And I hope you were able to participate in the first week. And if uh, if you've read either any of these three plays, I'd like to know your thoughts or if you posted a video, um, link it below so I can go watch it and see if I was anywhere close in my estimation of what was going on <laughs> with these women. So, all right, friends, I hope you have a great week and I will talk to you soon. Bye.